MCOM Net, second Monday at 7 p.m., W5FC. W5FC.
Mr. Chairman, I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet. This is in 5BB, November 5, Bravo, Bravo. And I will be your next control station for this session of Skynet. Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. Concerning the subject of astronomy and other space topics, our purpose is to help amateurs become more familiar with the nighttime and daytime sky, astronomy, and space in general. The net is open for all amateurs interested in this topic, and we encourage your participation, comments, and suggestions for this net. Stations with priority emergency traffic can enter the net at any time by using the post sign. Break, break in your call sign. Is there any emergency traffic at this time? Directed it. Please do not transmit while direct, without direction from net control. That would be me. And stations are reminded to identify at the end of your transmissions. This weekly net operates at 146.88 megahertz with a PL tone of 110.9. Check ins via Echolink are also possible using a W5FC-R station ID or Echolink node 37247. I will be logged into Echolink myself in just a moment because I forgot. But I will do it here in just a moment. Uh, tonight's topics, astronomy charts, pictures, and live audio video links are available online. Go to www.w5fc dot org right now for the complete list. Remember to tell others about this popular net. This is in 5BB, Skynet. All amateur operators are welcome. You do not need to be a member of any amateur radio club to participate. The net is 90 minutes long and structured in several parts. Now I'm logged into Echolink. Um, general announcements, Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas events, National Space Society events. The discussion topic of the evening by the net control was up, space exploration and, exploration and space history, constellation of the week, space launches of the week, recent astronomical discoveries, and visible satellite passages over the next couple of days. And then if we have any astronomical questions and answers in time, we can help them help you then, followed by the 73 round. All amateurs licensed to transmit here are invited to check in. So let's start with, with uh, uh, short time check-ins. Anybody that can't stay very long, please come down with your call sign, your name, and where you're transmitting from this evening.
try that again. This is Skynet in 5DB net control. Do we have any short time check ins? Kilo call 5 Zulu India X ray. Joe and Wiley, short time. Okay, we got one, KG5ZIX. Hello, Joe. Do you have any comments or questions for the net before you leave? No, thank you, sir. I really appreciate the, uh, the reply. I just wanted to check in. Thank you, sir. Very good. Okay, do we have any RF check-ins? These are general. We'll do echo link later. Do we have any general RF check-ins? If so, please come down with your call sign your name, and your location. This is in 5BB, Skynet. Kilo, Foxtrot 5, Juliet Hotel Alpha, Chaz, Planet Earth. Kilo 5. Delta Whiskey, John and Kapil. Five Gulf Romeo Hotel, Melissa in Cirque City. This is Alpha Alpha Five Alpha Hotel, Robert Richardson. November Tango Five, Tango Mike, Tony in Dallas. Five, India Charlie X-ray, Tom, Louisville. And this is Alpha Golf Five, Papa Mike, Rich in Rockwell. This is Whiskey Bravo Five, Oscar Zulu Lima, Brendan DeSoto. Mike, Charlie, Delta, Cody, and Dallas. This is Kilo Golf 5, Whiskey, Victor, Lima, James, and Carrollton. Clear. I recognize Chaz, KF5JHA. Already, uh, already choking over on Echo Link. And John, K5JDW. Melissa, KF5GRH. Robert, AA5AH. Tony, NC5TM. Tom, KE5ICX. Rich, KG5. Excuse me, AG5PM, Brenda, WB5OZL, Cody, K5MCD, and James, KG5WZL. Do we have any other RF check ins? This is in 5BB. Kilo 1, Golf Bravo, Delta, Galleon, Horny. One more, hello guy, K1GBD. Uh, one last try, any more RF check-ins? This is in 5 db Skynet. Kilo, Foxtrot 5, Zulu, Bravo, Lima, Bill, Farmer's Branch. Kilo, Golf 5, Alpha, Papa, Lima, Patrick, and Dallas. Okay, I recognize Bill, KF5ZBO, Patrick, KG5APL. Any other RF check-ins? Oh, 
Okay, now let's look at Echolink. Um, let's see, N5IMS. JJ is here in listen only mode. He knew I was going to ask the question, so he went ahead and uh, and uh, covered it. He's in Carrollton. And let's see, we have KF5NXR. John, would you like to check in? Well, I think I recognize his call, but I guess maybe he's not at the radio or can't transmit. I'll check him in anyway, John. Um, next, we have AG9SG. Antonio. Antonio, do you want to check in? Anyone else that would like to check in to Skynet to get any mode? This is N5BB at control. Okay. Uh, I'm getting some interesting messages from KF5NXR and KC5NOX. There's somebody named Gary. I don't know. Uh, Uh, Tom, would you look at the Echolink text? Uh, Chaz says Echolink volume seems very low, and it looks like somebody, um, Gary KC5NOX, was transmitting and it timed out. So uh, don't know what's going on. Uh, can you look into that, Tom? Yeah, Bill, it, it cut him off as part of the system, so it's okay. Your audio is a little lower than, than usual, although it, it did pick up just now, so I'm just mentioning that to you there. You're testing that KC5 idea. Okay. Don't know. I guess I can try talking up in the radio, but uh, I've used this radio many times in the past. Uh, just a moment. Microphone's going bad. Don't know. Okay, Antonio says he's listening only. Uh, Joe, KG5ZMG, do you want to check in? Joe Golf 5, Zulu Mike Golf, Joe in Arlington. We got you, Joe. Thank you very much. Okay, one more try. Does anybody want to check in via any mode? Uh, this is N5BB, Net Control for Skynet. Old Fox 5, November X-Ray Romeo, John, Kettle Mills. November Victor 5, Foxtrot, Virginia, in Fort Worth. Fort 
Okay. Recognize uh, John there in Caddo and Mills, KF5NXR, and uh, on Echolink, and then uh, Virginia in V5F in Fort Worth. Hello, Virginia. Okay, one more try. Any other chickens to Skynet? Come now. This is in 5 bb Okay, let's go for general announcements. Does anybody have any general announcements having to do with amateur radio, astronomy, or space, or something of general in interest to uh, licensed hands? If so, please come with your call sign only. This is N5BB Skynet, looking for general announcements. For Tango 5, Tango Mike. Okay, Tony. It's E5 TM. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Bill. Kind of a blizzard of things. I'll try to just hit the high points. I'd like to remind everyone we have one more net tonight. That's the Afterglow movie discussion at 10.30, featuring Inner Space from 1987. We also have a meeting on the air tomorrow at 7, a Racy's Trading Net tomorrow at 8, and Ham Fixin's Monday at 7. And most importantly, we do have a Dallas Amateur Radio Club meeting coming up this Tuesday. This Tuesday, it's our famous Old Timers Night program. Uh, you can join us at the Dallas Medical Center, the northeast corner of Webb Chapel and LBJ, in the third floor community room. You go into the main hospital building and you take the elevator up to the third floor and follow the sound of a happy socializing hand. Uh, there's always more stuff you can find out at w5sc.org, uh, but I'll uh, turn it back over to Net Control, NC5TF. Very good, Tony. Uh, there's something that I was, I'm going to announce. In fact, uh, JJ just wrote it down, but I was already going to say it before JJ even typed it in. The uh, DFW Late Traffic Net, uh, which meets on the 146.72 megahertz Irving repeater, is changing its start time starting tonight, April the 1st. It's going to be starting at 9.30 p.m. rather than 10.30. So it's an hour early. So in about uh, 13 minutes, uh, the DFW late traffic net will be starting. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, on 146.72, the Irving repeater. Um, so that's the news. Um, any other uh, announcements? Uh, this is in 5 bb Okay, we've got a bunch of nets. I'm going to try to go through these really quickly so it doesn't take half the net just to list the other nets. Uh, there are two AMSAT uh, nets, satellite nets. One is the Dallas one. Uh, on this repeater every Tuesday at 8 p.m., except for this coming Tuesday because it's a club meeting night. But every other Tuesday at 8 p.m., you'll hear it on this repeater um, Tuesday night. On Wednesday night, the AMSAT net is on the Arlington 147.14 megahertz repeater at 9 p.m. That's 9 p.m. on Wednesday. Arlington repeater. Uh, that's a 147.14 megahertz, 110.9 PL, positive offset. Uh, you do not have to be a member of AMSAT or any other group to participate. It's people interested in amateur satellite communications in general. And then real quickly, on Mondays we have a bunch of nets. On Mondays on this repeater, uh, the first week of the month, ham fixing, second week, and once Third week, I'm fixing. The fourth Monday of the month, the geek net, geeky things. 
the fifth week, if there is a fifth week, there isn't always. It's a surprise, Ned. We told you what it was. It wouldn't be a surprise. But it's always fun. Tuesdays, as I mentioned earlier, we have the AMSET Net on this repeater, 8 p.m., except when there's a club meeting. On Fridays, we have the Search City Simulation Net at 8 p.m. That's 8 p.m. on Fridays on this repeater. On Saturdays, we have a night of nets. We have Tech Net at 7 p.m., 10.30, and then we have the Afterglow Net at 10.30. Every day there is an ARRL traffic net, National System Traffic System net. It's at 6.30 p.m. on this repeater, except for next Tuesday when it'll be on the Irving repeater instead. But all other nights of the month, it'll be here at 6.30 p.m. on this frequency. Uh, and that's all. Now we have a, a, an afterglow movie tonight called Inner Space. A 1987 movie. Tom, would you like to read this carefully crafted synopsis? 85 ICX and 5 EV. Oh, Bill, you know I, I want to because it's my favorite part of the net. Here we go. Tonight's Afterglow Info is as follows. Spielberg looked at Joe Dante and thought about the possibilities. What if he could miniaturize himself and inject himself into the junior director's body? Spielberg could go off and do anything he wanted, never being subjected to the guardrail put up by his investors at his Ambling Entertainment. He looked at the Ambling logo, a drawing of a bicycle and that worn out, clumpy alien thing from one of his movies. He really wanted to be that kid and throw that alien off the flying bicycle. It had choked all his aspirations towards making serious movies. But knowing full well, if, if, if he were Joe Dante, he could go do anything he wanted, make any movie, and no one would be the wiser. Then it occurred to him, the alien machine he had fired from the real aliens could shrink him down to miniature size, and he could do films that he really wanted to make. And then it hit him. Why not make a movie about shrinking a goofy a actor like Martin Short to even smaller size and then inject him into Dennis Quaid's body. It was also far-fetched that this was Steven Spielberg after all. Join us for Inner Space from 1987 tonight at 10.30 p.m. Back to you, Bill. This is KB5 ICF. Thank you, Tom. You called me away from the radio, refilling my iced tea cup. Okay. Um, by the way, you can find out about all the Allison Radio Club events, etc., etc., by going to the club website, w5fc.org. Do we have any additional check-ins? Via any mode, this is in 5 pb Skynet. Astronomical Society of Dallas events. Chaz, what's going on with TAS? This is in 5 BB Skynet in progress. Thank you, Bill. Good evening, everyone. I should check in Bob the Cat. It would be a cool call sign for him would be K1TTY, but that's already taken. Anyway. The next Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Club meeting will be held on Friday, April the 28th. The meeting will be held at 7.30 p.m. in person at the University of Texas at Dallas. And it'll also be held on Zoom. That would be concurrently, or would be simultaneously. Yeah, okay. The feature speaker, I'm not sure of, and their topic, I don't know. Uh, I'll try to find out before next week's Skynet. Saturday night public observing sessions have begun again. Uh, in fact, a year ago is when they started up again. Skynet was picked to be on Saturday night so that there would be an opportunity for live reports from the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Public Observing Station. Now tonight, which is the first Saturday of the month, 
the stargazing is held at Fairview. Is there anyone at Fairview? I don't know if it was canceled because of the clouds, but if there's anyone at Fairview observing tonight, please come now with your call sign and make a report. It's a long skip over the repeater, and it probably has to be on Echo Link. Okay. It might have been canceled to the cloud. Now, you can check the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas website at texasastro.org for up-to-date information and details about meetings and public observing sessions. And this is KF5JHA, Vector Net Control. Well, it's yours, N5BB. Thank you, Chad. Um, does anybody have any questions, comments, or does anybody want to check in? This is N5BB, that can draw. Okay, next we have National Space Society events and activities. I happen to be the net control, the uh, member at large and the membership director for the North Texas chapter of the National Space Society. Our regular membership meetings are held on the second Sunday of every month. So our, uh, our next meeting is going not to be tomorrow, but the following Sunday. That's Sunday afternoon, uh, April the 9th. We meet at 3.30 p.m. at Spring Creek Barbecue. Uh, and Irving at the southwest corner of Highway 183 and Beltline Road. Our website is ntx.nss.org. That's the National Space Society of North Texas. Our big event coming up is the International Space Development Forum. This is ISDC2023. This big conference, space conference, will be held on May 25th, 28th of this year in Frisco at the MC Suites by Hilton, which is a kind of very big uh, Frisco conference center up there, convention center. Uh, nice, huge rooms, big hallways, really nice. I was up there on Monday where we previewed it, kind of looked at the facility. Early discounted reservations end on April the 15th. So you've got about two more weeks if you want to uh, get your earlier reservations. Uh, the prices are much cheaper if you uh, sign up early. You can register at isdc2023.nss.org. That's International Space Development Conference. Website, ISDC. 2023.nss.org. The National Space Society North Texas Chapter holds a Space Rendezvous social event starting at 6 p.m. on the last Friday evening of each month. And I'm currently the coordinator of that. At this time, the location is 54th Street Restaurant and Draft House on Highway 635 in Irving. This is west of MacArthur near Olympus. The, this is real close to Capel, but it's actually in Irving. The March Space Rendezvous was held last evening, the last day of March, and six space enthusiasts attended, including me. We had a lot of fun. Great. It was just great. Uh, we have an active Facebook page, Type National Space Society of North Texas into the search box. Uh, we also have a, there's a meetup group for this space rendezvous and our meetings. So if you look at meetup for National Space Society of North Texas or space rendezvous, you should find us if you're familiar with meetup, the meetup uh, website. 
Do we have any questions, comments, or check-ins? This is in 5 db Magazine Journal of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. This particular article was written by Daniel Cleary. And it's got some interesting pictures in it, and Tom added some links to some other interesting uh, pictures. Um, Charlotte Mason, an astrophysicist at the University of Copenhagen, had modest expectations nine months ago, but when she and her collaborators began to use James Webb Space Telescope, this is abbreviated JWST, the giant new space telescope to look back in time for the universe's first galaxies. So she had, she had modest expectations when they, they were starting to do this. Modeling suggested the patch of sky they were examining would hold just 0.2 galaxies. In other words, none unless they got lucky. You know, one out of five chance. Yet, out of the images popped not one, but two bright galaxies. This was the biggest surprise to me, she says. The surprises have kept coming. JWST astronomers have found more than 15 galaxies shining within the first half billion years of the 13.7 billion year old universe. Far too many, according to theorist models of galaxy formation. Initial estimates of the galaxy's age and distance come from their brightness at particular wavelengths. But astronomers are now applying the gold standard method, analyzing the galaxy's spectra in detail to see how much their light has been stretched by the expansion of the universe. This is called redshift. And remember, they've only looked at a few areas, uh, but they're just finding many more than they anticipated. The spectra have confirmed nine of the early galaxies, including two added to the roster this week, following JWST observations on March the 24th. So this is new information here, came coming from 24th of March. This is the most exciting period of my recent life. Casey Popovich of Texas A&M University at College Station, Texas, told astronomers last week at a meeting of the Kavli Institute for Cosmology in Cambridge, England. The discoveries are leaving theorists scratching their heads. The standard theory of cosmology, the lambda cold dark matter theory, says clouds of dark matter, the mysterious stuff making up 85% of the universe's mass, began to clump up into halos soon after the Big Bang. The halos of strong gravity sucked in gas which collapsed to form stars. This LCDM, that's Lambda Cold Dark Matter Theory, cannot account for the excess galaxies astronomers are seeing. But few astronomers are ready to tear it up. Let's get a bigger population, says Alice 
Chafee of the University of California, Los Angeles. Then it will be time to look at series. This is in 5 BB, Skydance. Runs of the Dallas Amateur Radio Club. Instead, cosmologists wonder whether the excess of galaxies in the newborn universe is more apparent than real. It could be that surveys so far have, by chance, zoomed in on areas dense with galaxies. The apparent excess could also arise if the galaxies are merely overly bright and stuffed with stars. So more of them poke above the threshold that JWST, that's the James Webb Space Telescope, can see. But that creates a new theoretical problem. Why are they so bright and full of stars? There's no convincing explanation yet, says Richard Ellis of University College in London. In young galaxies closer to Earth, feedbacks limit the rate of star formation. Theorists believe baby stars emit stellar winds. These are streams of particles that slow the process by blowing gas out of the galaxy. Adding to the effect are supernova, which, emit, which occur when fast-burning stars run out of fuel, collapsing and triggering explosions that blow away gas and surround the galaxy with dust, scattering its light and giving it a reddish hue. The galaxy's gravity draws some of the gas back in. The star formation efficiency, a measure of stars formed per unit of gas, typically sticks below 10%. This is in 5 BB. Abishai Dekel of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem argues that star formation must have been more efficient in the early universe, which was physically much smaller. The gas from which stars form would have been a 1,000 times denser than it is after billions of years of expansion of the universe, making star formation easier. Moreover, that primordial gas was not yet enriched with the heavier elements and dust formed by supernova. As a result, the stellar winds of those first stars would have been less intense than today and a weaker break on star formation. For one million years or so, Dekel says, these galaxies could churn out stars with a formation efficiency of nearly 100%. All galaxies at this epoch should make a feedback-free starburst if they are massive enough. What's more, the lack of dust would have allowed the stars to shine more brightly than comparable stars today, and at the bluer wavelengths seen by James Webb Space Telescope. Remember, these are a long distance away, so they're very, very, very red-shifted. So even though the James Webb Space Telescope can see in the infrared, uh, it was originally very blue light, it's being shifted into the infrared because of the expansion of the universe. Oh, this is inside BB. Andrea Ferrara of the Scuola Normale Superior in Pisa, Italy, takes a different tack. He says the dense galaxies of the early universe would ramp up star formation in cycles that repeat every 100 million years. During the star forming phases, the radiation pressure from the stars would blast out dust, making the galaxies appear bright and blue. Ferreira finds some evidence to support the model. The JWST spectrum of one distant galaxy, GNZ 11, had one spectral line for hydrogen gas shifted out of place as if the gas was moving at 300 kilometers per second. We see clear signs of outflowing material with radiation pressure sweeping out both hydrogen and dust, he says. JWST has also spied a galaxy without signs of star formation 700 million years after the Big Bang. 
which Ferreira suggests could be in a quite phase between stars forming bursts. This is Skynet in 5 dB net control. Another possible explanation for the galaxy's surprising whiteness is that it was driven not by stars, but massive black holes at their heart. Hot disk of dust and gas swirling down the gravitational drains of monster black holes are what drives quasars, some of the brightest objects in the universe. But astronomers have not seen quasars any earlier than about 650 million years after the Big Bang, and they struggled to explain how their black holes could have grown big enough to blaze brightly much earlier. Nonetheless, at the Copley Conference, Pavlovich showed the JWST spectrum of a galaxy from when the universe was 550 million years old. It showed a hint of light being both stretched and squeezed, a telltale sign of swirling gases around the black hole. Ellis still isn't convinced giant black holes could form early enough. The black hole idea is the most extreme, he says. Few want to count the, an even more extreme option, that the LCDM that's the Lambda Cold Dark model, is at fault. It could be tweaked to produce more, excuse me, Lambda Cold Dark Matter. It could be tweaked to produce more dark matter halos or larger ones to concentrate gas more quickly in the bigger galaxies. But theorists are loath to tinker with it because it explains so many things so well the observed distributions of galaxies, the abundances of primordial gases, and the accelerating expansion of the universe. We'd be at risk of screwing everything else up, Ferrara says. You'd need to be pretty desperate. So, James Webb Space Telescope is really shaking things up with so much data, so many early galaxies and they didn't think they'd see them. It's just an amazing amount of data for the theorists to go and a lot of work. A lot of work for astronomers. Okay, this is N5BB, Skynet Net Control. Do we have any additional check-ins or questions? Good double. Uh, Sean in Fort Worth. Check in again, please. Yeah, this is Kilo Bravo 9, Sierra Oscar Kilo, Sean in Fort Worth. I recognize Sean, KB9 SOK. Who is the other station? Sorry about that. Um, W5BLT, Whiskey 5, Bacon, Lettuce, Tomato, Bill in uh, Garland. That's okay, Bill. W5BLT. You guys just happen to start transmitting at the same time. There's no need to apologize. It happens all the time. Okay, do we have any other check-ins to Skynet? This is in 5 bb Next, we have Chaz, KF5JHA. Who's going to talk about what's up? Hey, Chaz, what's up? In 5BB net control, go ahead. Thank you, Bill. Good evening, everyone. Yes, this is Chaz, KF5JHA. We call this segment of Skynet What's Up because it's all about what's going on astronomically over the next couple of weeks. Well, maybe a little bit further in the future. Slide Master, that was slide number one. Slide number two, please. Now, the reason why I've been absent over the last two Skynet sessions is that I was in Big Ben trying to see all 110 Messier objects in a single night. This is called a Messier Marathon. On the night of March 22nd, 23rd, 
on a partly cloudy night. I was able to observe 103 out of the 110 Messier objects in one night. Again, the goal is to observe 110 Messier objects in a single night. But I was unable to get all of them due to clouds in the northwest evening sky and the morning twilight prevented a few objects from being seen in the morning sky. My friend Dennis Harwell was able to get 106 Messier objects out of the 110 that night. <sighs> Maybe again another time. 110 and a night would be awesome. Slide master, slide number three, please. Uh, now let's look at the current evening sky. If you face southwest in this evening sky, if you get rid of the clouds, Orion can be found by looking at the three stars of equal brightness all in a straight line and evenly spaced. This is the belt of Orion. There are two bright stars above the belt that represent Orion's shoulders. The brighter one on the left is Betelgeuse or Betelgeist, and the other one on the right is Bellatrex. The two stars below Orion's belt are Orion's knees. One on the left is Sias, and the one on the right is Rigel. Slide master, slide number four. Now using Orion's belt and drawing down and to the left, you run into the brightest star in the sky other than the sun. It's called Sirius. It's a doggone good star. Well, it's called the dog star. Uh, Sirius is the brightest star in the constellation of the big dog, which is Canis Major. And it's the brightest star in the sky other than the sun. Slide master, slide number five, please. Now, if you go back to Orion's belt and draw a line from the belt stars up and to the right, you should run into the brightest star in the constellation of Taurus the Bull called Aldebaran. If you keep on going in that straight line just a little bit more, you should see a little cluster of faint stars called the Pleiades. Aldebaran's stellar classification is a K5-3 star. Betelgeuse's, or Betelgeuse's classification is an M1-1 star. What are these classifications called? Slide master, slide number six. Stars are classified by temperature and luminosity. The temperature ratings are actually letters. The hottest stars are O type and the coolest stars are M type. The types from hottest to coolest are O, B, A, S, G, K, M. We remember the order of them by a mnemonic called O, B, A, fine girl, kiss me. The hottest stars type O, are more than 30,000 degrees Kelvin. The uh, B-type stars are between 10,000 and 30,000. Type A stars are between 7,500 to 10,000. Type F stars are between 6,000 uh, 6, to 7,500. The G stars, like our sun, are between 5,200 to 6,000 degrees K. The K stars are between 3,700 to 5,200 degrees Kelvin. The M type stars are 3,700 degrees Kelvin or less. These, there are 10 subcategories within each type. An O9 type and a B0 type are right next to each other on this scale. This is called the Harvard Classification System. It was developed by Annie Jump Cannon. We call the, uh, we have talked about her in the past Skynet, and I'm sure we will talk more about her again in future Skynet. Slide master, slide number seven, please. Luminosity classifications of stars are rated in Roman numerals, zero through BII, which is seven. Uh, main sequence stars are like our sun are rated as a V, which is type five. Hypergiants are rated as zero. White dwarfs are rated as VII. Seven again. This system of luminosity classification is called the Morgan Canaan system. When I attended the Ohio State University, Dr. Canaan was a professor emeritus, meaning he was retired, but he still had an office and came in a couple of times a week. I got to see him occasionally in the astronomy department. I remember the, that graduate students would hand him a glass plate spectrum of stars, uh, but oriented backwards to try to fool Dr. Canan. Dr. Canan would immediately reorient the glass plate, hand it back to the graduate student, and tell them the exact stellar classification of the star. And he was always correct. The Morgan Canan classification system of the sun is G25 star. Slide master, slide number eight, please.
Now on to the moon. The first quarter moon was on March the 28th, just a few days ago, so the current phase of the moon is a waxing gibbous. Full moon occurs on April the 5th. The third quarter moon will be on April the 13th. On April the 15th, the moon is at perigee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is closest to the Earth at a distance of 367,968 kilometers. New moon is on April the 19th. On April the 27th, there will be a first quarter moon. On April the 28th, the moon is at apogee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is furthest from the Earth at a distance of 404,299 kilometers. Slide master, slide number nine, please. If you're wondering what I'm talking about on slides, uh, we have a video version of Skynet. You can get those links at w, um, <laughs> www.w5sc.org, and you can get the links. One of the video links, at least, is uh, YouTube video. Wow. It's live streaming. Slidemaster, that was slide number nine. Is what I'm talking about right now. April the 10th is when a beautiful conjunction of the planet Venus and the open cluster of the Pleiades, which is also known as Messier 45, happens to be in the west-northwestern evening sky. Slide master, slide number 10. On April the 9th, uh, 16th, excuse me, there will be a conjunction of Saturn and the moon in the eastern morning sky. I saw Saturn in the morning sky last week during my Messier marathon. Slide master, slide number 11. The very next morning on April the 17th, there will be a conjunction of the planet Neptune and the moon in the eastern morning sky. Remember, Neptune, you're going to have to use a telescope to see. Slide master, slide number 12. On April the 20th, there's a penumbral lunar eclipse, but it's not visible from North America. It's going to be visible on the other side of the Earth. Slide master, slide number 13. The meteor shower, the Leonid meteor shower, is at its peak on the night of April the 21st, 22nd, with a maximum of 18 to up to maybe 90 meteors per hour. To get more details about meteors and meteor showers, you can visit the International Meteor Organization at www.imo.net or the American Meteor Society at www.amsmeteors.org. Slide master, slide number 14, please. Here's a conjunction on April the 21st of the planet Neptune, Mercury, and the Moon in the west northwestern evening sky 22nd the planet venus and the moon are in conjunction and again in the west northwestern evening sky and this is kf5 jj and this is skynet slide master slide number 16. really already talked about the texas astronomical society of dallas but if you want to get more information about details and meetings and their public observing stations, go to texasastro.org. Slide master, slide number 17. So do any of you out there in Radio Land have any questions or need a fill on any of the information, or do you just have a general astronomy question? Come now with your call sign if you have a question or need a fill. So as the moon wanes, or it did earlier uh, a couple of weeks ago, so do these words of this segment of Skynet. Stay safe, keep well, pray for our world. It's the only one where humans live right now. And until next week, uh, well, actually, I'll be doing another Skynet segment in a few minutes. Keep looking up so you know what's up. And this is KF5JHA. Back to our net control, Bill. It's yours in 5BB. Well, thank you, Chaz. This is N5BB Net Control. <clears throat> Do we have any additional check-ins? Skynet. And now we're going to do the space exploration in space history um, section. And it's either Brenda or Kelly. So whichever one it is, please come on now with space exploration and space history. This is in 5 dB. 
This is WB5OZL, and it's my turn this week. So, first in news, um, NASA is inviting the media to see the Mars habitat before the crew enters it for one year. Media are invited to mi- visit NASA's simulated Mars habitat on Tuesday, April 11th, at the agency's Johnson Space Center in Houston. This summer, four volunteers will begin a year-long Mars mission in the ground-based habitat, helping NASA prepare for human exploration of Mars for the benefit of humanity. The mission is the first of three planned in NASA's um, it's C-H-A-P-E-A it's, uh, I don't know how they say it, it's a habitat our crew health and performance exploration analog. It is scheduled to begin in June when the volunteer crew, who are not astronauts, enters the 3D printed habitat. During the simulation, crew members will carry out different types of mission activities, including simulated spacewalks, robotic operations, habitat maintenance, personal hygiene exercise, and crop growth. To be as Mars realistic as feasible, the crew will also face environmental stressors such as resource limitations, isolation, and equipment failure. The in-person media event includes an opportunity to speak with subject matter experts and capture B-roll and photos inside the habitat. Crew members will not be available as they'll arrive at NASA Johnson later this spring to begin training for this simulated mission. Next, NASA prepares for historic asteroid sample delivery on September 24th. NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft is cruising back to Earth with a sample it collected from the rocky surface of asteroid Bennu when its sample capsule parachutes down into the Utah desert On September 24th, OSIRIS-REx will become the United States' first ever mission to return an asteroid sample to Earth. After seven years in space, including a nail-biting touchdown on Bennu to gather dust and rocks, this intrepid mission is about to face one of its biggest challenges yet, deliver the asteroid sample to Earth while protecting it from heat, vibrations, and earthly contaminants. Once the sample capsule touches down, our team will be racing against the clock to recover it and get it to the safety of a temporary clean room, says Mike Moreau, Deputy Project Manager at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Asteroids are the ancient materials left over from the original era of planet formation, and many contain molecular precursors to life. Scientists have learned a great deal from studying asteroid fragments that have naturally reached the ground as meteorites. But to understand whether whether asteroids played a role in delivering these compounds to Earth's surface over 4 billion years ago, the scientists need a pristine sample from space free from terrestrial contaminants. In addition, the most fragile rocks observed on Bennu probably would not have survived passage through Earth's atmosphere as meteorites. There are two things pervasive on Earth, water and biology, said Dr. Jason Dworkin, OSIRIS-REx project manager at NASA Goddard. Both can severely alter meteorites when they land on the ground and muddle the story, told by the sample's chemistry and mineralogy. A pristine sample could provide insights into the development of the solar system. Next, NASA's next rocket to lift off for the moon will be rolled out to the launch pad using a Guinness World Record site setting ride. The Artemis upgraded Apollo era crawler transportation transporter 2 has been certified as the heaviest self-powered vehicle in the world weighing in at 6.65 million pounds the giant 
tracked vehicle reached its current weight after upgrades to support the space launch system, as completed in 2016. Now, birthdays. March 29, 1965, William uh, Ophelein, I hope that's how you say it. He um, I was born in 1965, and he flew on STS-116. Michael Foreman, March 29, 1957, STS-123 and 129. Joseph N. Paul, March 30, 1943. STS-50. Patrick G. Forrester, March 31st, 1957. Missions were STS-105, 117, and 128. And William Frederick Fisher, April 1st, 1946. STS-51I. And this week in space history, on March 29th, 37 years later to the day, the Messenger spacecraft sent back the first photo of Mercury from orbit. On this day in 2011, Messenger gave scientists the first new data on the composition of Mercury's surface since Mariner 10's final 1975 flyby. April 1st, 1959, 64 years ago, the first NASA astronauts, the Mercury 7, were chosen and announced on April 9th. Of them, L. Shepard went on to crew a mission to the moon. On March 28th, the final test of Saturn 1's first stage, Saturn SA-4, launched from NASA Kennedy, the uncrewed um, the suborbital test flight was successful, paving the way for a test of the second stage. All right, I'm done. Back to net, WB5OZL. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Brenda, with a lot of information here. This is N5BB. Uh, Skynet. I can scroll down to the right place here. Uh, make it five check-ins before I turn it back over to Chaz. Any more check-ins? This is N5BB. KF5JHA and 5BB. Time for Miss Carolyn's Constellations. Thank you, Bill. I wanted to say so much. Me, 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 me. Pick me. Okay. Miss Carolyn's Constellations of the Week is named in honor of Silent Key Carolyn, KC5OZT. Carolyn contributed to Skynet each week, almost from its beginning in 2012 until May of 2019, with a detailed look at one particular constellation each week. Since about 52 easily visible constellations seen in Texas throughout the year of, out of the 88 total constellations, so Miss Carolyn covered the entire sky as seen over North Texas in a year. In her honor, we've continued that tradition of a constellation per week and named this segment after her. Miss Carolyn's Constellations of the Week this week is Lynx, the Wildcat, and Cancer of the Crab. Lynx is one of the most uh, more modern-day recent constellations, first appearing in 1690, on a star chart. Before this, the stars in this region were sometimes depicted as a tiger, but this has fallen into disuse. For those who enjoy observing double stars, Lynx is known for its collection of double stars. Now, slide master, slide number 20, please, is my first round of jokes of the week. Okay, when I searched uh, Canadian cats on Google, it just gives me a bunch of links. See, that's the name of a constellation we're talking about. Okay. Did you hear about the bobcat? Well, it sounds like my cat. Did you hear about the bobcat who found 
his long lost cousin. He followed Lynx and his family. Why are those big cats over there blue? Because they're just hyper Lynx. Did you hear about the lady who bought a fur coat? She wanted to be the Miss in Lynx. Okay, I don't know if these are working too well. This lynx just ate 50 rabbits. I guess it was a bad hair day. And this is KF5JHA, and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 21, please. Link, start at Orion and go north. You should arrive at a Star Capello, which is uh, about overhead right now. Then you go to the left or east, and you'll run into the faint stars of the constellation of Lynx. Slide master, slide number 23. The star 12 Lynxes, a triple star system with the A and B components separated by only 1.5 times the diameter of our solar system giving a separation of only about 1.7 arc seconds is seen from the Earth. The component C is about 8.7 arc seconds from the AB pair. Another star, a double star, 38 Lynxus, is a nice double star with different colors between the two members. Slide master, slide number 24. NGC 2419 is a very distant globular cluster um, commonly known as the intergalactic wanderer because for so many years it's believed not to be part of the Milky Way's family of globular clusters. Nowadays, however, it's generally accepted to be a long, high eccentric elliptical orbiting galactic cluster around the Milky Way. NGC 2419 was believed to be, oh, I already said that. Uh, it, it's thought to have been the furthest known uh, globular cluster until Further globular clusters were finally found. The most recent estimates place NGC 2419 about 300,000 light years from our solar system. Slide masters, slide number 25. Let's go to the constellation of Cancer the Crab. It represents a crab that Juno sent to further harass and distract Hercules while he was battling the monster Hydra. The crab nipped at Hercules' toes with its claws and was soon crushed and killed by Hercules. Juno placed it in the sky to commemorate it. Oh, slide master, slide number 26 is our second round of jokes for the week. Okay, here we go. How do crustaceans celebrate birthdays? With crab cakes, of course. What do you call a crab that doesn't like to share? Shellfish. Why did the hermit crab refuse to go in his shell? Because it was claustrophobic. What do you call a female crab that is also single? Miss Shell. Come on, that was funny. A crab walks into a bar and the bartender says, We can't serve you. You're already walking sideways. Oh, that's funny, too. Slide master, slide number 27. To find Cancer, you go south of Lynx, but you also can find it between the constellations of Leo and Gemini. Slide master, slide number 28. Data can carry. That's a star. Uh, is also known as Tegmenai, I guess that's how you pronounce it, which means covering, referring to the crab shell or exoskeleton. It's a triple star uh, system uh, from shifts in the orbit of the star's C, and it, this D component was finally physically resolved into adaptive optics camera uh, in the 3.6 meter Canadian France Hawaiian telescope in the year 2000. Wow. Okay, so a triple star system. Slide master, slide number 29. 
M44 is also known as the beehive cluster or precipice, uh, which is Latin for manger. The beehive nickname is also a recent, although it comes from the same name. It turns out that the word precipice can be interpreted as either manger or beehive. The manger interpretation is the older of the two and represents the manger in which the two donkeys are feeding. The beehive representation is also appropriate since the stars in the cluster resemble a swarm of bees. From a dark sky site, M44 is easily visible to the unaided eye as a fuzzy patch of light in the heart of Cancer. With its telescope uh, in the year 1610, Galileo was the first to reveal M44's true nature and resolve it into stars, describing it as a mass of more than 40 small stars. At times, the moon will pass in front of M44, providing a night of many occultations of the beehive stars. And this is KF5, JHA, and this is Skynet. Slide master, slide number 30. There are a few more Astronomical League observing program objects than the completion of Lynx, some wildcat, and Cancer the Crab. I've just given you a sampling of uh, some of those objects. The Astronomical League has, at last count, 75 different observing programs, most of which have about 100 objects. Now, if you observe just 10 different objects in an observing program each month, then you can earn an observing certificate and a pen in about a year. Slide master, slide number 31, and that is Miss Carolyn's Constellations of the Week. Lynxes, or Lynx, the Cat, and Cancer the Crab. I want to thank my friends Dave Hutchinson and Dennis Harwell for their research and words on deep sky objects that I've used, borrow on steel for every Skynet. I also at times use the website constellation-guide.com for information. Now next time, I'll take a look at Leo the Lion and Leo Minor, the small lion. And this is kf 5 JHA sending it back to our night control. Good night, everyone. 73. Bill, it's all yours. In 5 BB. Okay, Chaz, this is N5BB, net control for Skynet. Do we have any additional check-ins? Tom, KE5ICX, we got some space launches this week. We are early. It's only 12 minutes after the hour. This is N5BB. What do you say, Tom? Yes, Bill, we do indeed, and I get all this information from my head. No, I don't. I get them from spacecoastlaunches.com and from spaceflightnow.com. So here's uh, what I've got. There's a bunch of things. I'm probably going to cut this off at some point as we go on forever, but here's the interesting one. Uh, the SDA Trick 0A that was supposed to launch on Friday will now launch on April 2nd on a Falcon 9 rocket, the SOC. 4E launch site, Vandenberg Space Force Base. There will be 10 Trachy Zero demonstration satellites the U.S. Military Space Development Agency that will be launched. It will be the first of two Falcon 9 missions to carry SDA demonstration spacecraft for a future constellation of military missile tracking and data relay satellites. Falcon 9's first stage booster will return to landing zone 4 at Vandenberg. On April 7th, we have another Falcon 9 launching the Intelsat 40E Tempo from SLC-40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Base, Florida. Uh, the satellites for the Intelsat uh, program, 40E, will join Intelsat's epic fleet of high-throughput satellites providing in-flight connectivity and other mobile communication services over North and Central America. 40E is a partial replacement for the Intelsat 29E, which failed in 2019. 40E hosts NASA's troposcopic mission monitoring of pollution, called TEMPO, instrument to measure and on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. Then we have on uh, sometime in April, Falcon 9 Transporter 7 launch. This mission is a rideshare flight in the sun-synchronous orbit with numerous small microsatellites and nanosatellites for commercial and government customers. The Falcon 9's first stage booster will land in landing zone 4 at Vandenberg. 
On April 13th will be a launch of an Ariane 5 with the JUICE uh, spacecraft. This is, uh, will launch from, um, it, well, it'll be called VA-260 uh, to launch the European Space Agency's Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer Program, or JUICE. The JUICE spacecraft built by Airbus will make detailed observations of the giant gas giant and its three large ocean-bearing moons. Game meets with Stone Europa with a suite of remote sensing, geophysical, and in situ instruments. JUICE will enter orbit around Jupiter in July of 2031. This marks the next JUICE launch of Europe. Ariane 5 rocket. Also in April, and to be determined, Worldview Mission 1 and 2 will launch from SLC 40 at Cape Canaveral. The Falcon 9 rocket once again will launch a second pair of old 3 d M Power broadband internet satellites in medium Earth orbit for SES Luxembourg. Satellites built by Boeing will provide internet services over most of the populated world, building on SDS's old 3 d network. The Falcon 9 first stage booster will land on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. Then we have, uh, let's see here, April again. This will be a PSLV launch. This is from Satish Dhawan Space Center in Sariheri Kota, India. India's Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, or PSLV, will launch the Telos 2 satellite to Singapore. Telos 2 was built by Singapore by SP Electronics and carries an all-weather synthetic aperture radar Earth observation payload. Next up, another Falcon 9 to launch Starlink 5-9 from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. This will be another batch of Starlink V1.5 internet satellites. The first stage booster will land on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. On April 18th, here's something different. We get a Falcon Heavy. Viasat 3 Americas will launch from Launch Complex 39A at Cape Kennedy Space Center. The S satellite, uh, let me see here, the Falcon SpaceX Heavy will launch the VIA Satellite 3 America's Broadband Communication Satellite. VIA Sat 3 America's is the first of at least three new generation going built geosynchronary satellites for VIA Sat. Small communication satellite named Arcturus will launch as a secondary payload for Astronus. Then let's see, we have April 20th, a, a Delta 4 Heavy launching Enrol 60. This will be from SLC-37B from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The United Launch Line Delta IV Heavy Rocket will launch a classified by satellite cargo to the U.S. Naval Reconnaissance Office, the largest of the Delta IV family. The heavy version features three common core boost, uh, cores mounted together to form a triple body rocket. Next we have, uh, hopefully, in April, the Starship Orbital Test Flight from Starbase Boca Chica Beach, Texas. The Super Heavy SpaceX Starship Launch Vehicle will launch on its first orbital test flight. The mission will attempt to travel around the world for nearly one full orbit, resulting in re-entry and splashdown of the Starship near Hawaii. And let's see here, we'll do uh, one more on April 28th, Falcon 9, it'll be, here we go again, this time it's the O3B Empower 3 and 4 from SLC-40 in Cape Canaveral. SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket will launch the second pair of O3B Empower broadband internet satellites into medium Earth orbit for SDS of, SDS of Luxembourg. And then uh, finally, on sometime in April, Starlink 6-3 will launch, SLC-40, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. It will make a Falcon 9, will launch another batch of second generation Falcon Starlink V2 mini internet satellite. The Falcon 9 first stage booster will land on the drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. I'm going to end it there, Bill. There's plenty more to come, but we can cover those in later next. So back to you, Bill, ke 5 ITM. Okay, Tom, do we have any additional check-ins since uh, BB? Next, it's time for Brenda again, recent astronomical discoveries. 
WB5OZL, N5BB. Take it away, Brenda. Thank you, Bill. This is WB5OZL. Um, this article is entitled, Redness of Neptunian Asteroids Sheds Light on Early Solar System. Asteroids sharing their orbits with the planet Neptune have been observed to exist in a broad spectrum of red color, implying the existence of two populations of asteroids in the region. According to a new study by an international team of researchers, the research is published in the journal Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society Letters. The team of scientists from the USA, California, France, the Netherlands, Chile, and Hawaii observed 18 asteroids sharing the orbit of Neptune, known as Neptunian Trojans. They are between 50 and 100 kilometers in size and are located at a distance of around 4.5 billion kilometers from the sun. Asteroids orbiting this far away are faint and so are challenging for astronomers to study. Before the new work, only about a dozen Neptunian Trojans had been studied requiring the use of some of the largest telescopes on Earth. The new data were gathered over the course of two years using the WASP wide-field camera on the Palomar Observatory Telescope in California, the GMOS cameras on the Gemini North and South Telescopes in Hawaii and Chile, and the LRIS camera on the Keck Telescope in Hawaii. Of the 18... Of the 18 observed Neptunian Trojans, several were more, much redder than most asteroids and compared with other asteroids in this group looked at in previous studies, redder asteroids are expected to have formed much further from the sun. One population of these is known as the cold classical trans Neptunian, uh, Neptunian uh, Objects found beyond the orbit of Pluto at about 6 billion kilometers from the Sun. The newly observed Neptunian Trojans are also unlike asteroids located in the orbit of Jupiter, which are typically more neutral in color. The redness of the asteroids implies that they contain a higher proportion of more volatile ices, such as ammonia and methanol. These are extremely sensitive to heat and can rapidly transform into gas if the temperature rises, so are more stable at large distances from the sun. The location of the asteroids at the same orbital distance as Neptune also implies they are stable on time scales comparable to the age of the solar system. They effectively act as a time capsule recording the initial conditions of the solar system. The presence of redder asteroids among the Neptunian Trojans suggests the existence of a transition zone between more neutral colored and redder objects. The redder Nept Neptunian asteroids may have formed beyond this transition boundary before being captured into the orbit of Neptune. The Neptunian Trojans would have been captured into the same orbit as the planet Neptune uh, as the ice giant planet migrated from the inner solar system to where it is now some 4.5 billion kilometers from the sun. Lead author Dr. Bryce Bolin of the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center said, in our new work we have more than doubled the sample of Neptunian Trojans studied with large telescopes. It's exciting to find the first evidence of redder asteroids in this group. Because we have a larger sample of Neptunian Trojans with measured colors, we can now start to see major differences between asteroid groups. Our observations also show that the Neptunian Trojans are also different in color compared to asteroid groups even further from the sun. A possible explanation may be that the processing of the surfaces of asteroids by the sun's heat may have different effects for asteroids at varying solar distances. Okay, this is from uh, ScienceDaily.com. 
Back to net, WB5OZL. Very good, Brenda. <clears throat> Do we have any additional check-ins? This is N5DB, Skynet. K5ICX, N5DB, you got any interesting visible satellite passages, N5DB? I do, Bill. Uh, this, is, uh, this information uh, comes from heavensabove.com. You can go there, plug in your longitude and latitude, and it will provide you with all of the popular satellites, including amateur radio satellites, too, if you're so inclined. Uh, without having to use any sort of special software. At any rate, the International Space Station has three passes that are pretty good. We have one on April 2nd, tomorrow, uh, minus 3.8 magnitude at 21.22 in the evening. At northwest, it'll reach its highest point almost directly overhead at 21.25 at 80 degrees, and it'll fall at 21.25 at 80 degrees uh, into shadow uh, to the west. On April 3rd, we have a nice pass, minus 3.4 magnitude. This one's more of a fuller pass at the 2034 uh, p.m. Now the northwest has reached its highest point at 2038 at 50 degrees, and it'll fall at 2040 to the east-southeast at 18 degrees. And then finally, on April 5th, a nice pass, minus 2.6 magnitude, 2020-30, I'm sorry, 2035 uh, in the evening, uh, the west-northwest will reach its highest point at 2038 at 41 degrees, and it will fall at 2042 to south-southeast at 10 degrees. Next up is Tian Gong uh, Space Station. This is uh, the Chinese space station. I believe there's three tacky knots up there right now. April 7th uh, has a good pass, minus 1.2 magnitude at 6.04 a.m. out of the south-southwest to reach the highest point at 6.06, or two minutes later at 40 degrees, and it will fall from the east-northeast at 6.09. There's another good pass on April 8th. Uh, there's actually two passes. The better of the two is minus 1.8 magnitude at 6.37, to the northeast. And then finally for uh, the Tian Gong uh, Space Station, April 9th will have a minus 2.3 magnitude. This will be a pretty good one, I believe. At 5.37 in the morning, it'll be coming out of shadow at 73 degrees out of the south. It'll reach its highest point at 5.37 at 76 degrees, and then it'll fall to the south-southeast at 5.40. That's a really good pass because of the minus 2.3 magnitude, so it should be Normal easily thing. visible here in Dallas. And Bill, I'm going to end it there. Uh, there are other uh, passes. Uh, one of the popular satellites that you can check every night, uh, a couple of times a, a night, is the um, Envisat, which is a very large old weather satellite. It's out of commission, but it has a huge footprint, and you can see the very bright uh, see it, uh, uh, reflect light uh, back to Earth very brightly. So back to you, Bill, ke 5 is here. Thank you, Tom. Okay, end of the net, last call. Do we have any final check-ins, questions, or comments before I close the net? This is N5BB, Skynet. I'm completely operational, and all my circuits are functioning perfectly. Afterglow movie net. Tonight we had 23 hams participating on the air, or on Echolink. Thanks to all who checked in this evening. We hope you join us here next week and every Saturday night at 9 p.m. to discuss astronomy, space, and space exploration. On this net, the sky is never the limit. We're always looking for net control stations. If you're interested, send an email to net. That's N-E-T-S at W5SC.org. You can follow topics and discussions about all this kind of stuff by going to W5FC.org. Until next Saturday night, this is N5BB. I'll be closing a net at 9.30 p.m. exactly.
monitoring or beta at normal amateur use. And remember, there is no traffic net on Irving right now because it's been moved to an hour earlier. So the traffic net is late traffic net is now at 9.30 on the Irving repeater in 5BB clear. Good night. Good night, Bill. Alpha Fox 5 Delta. call that the semi-late traffic net, but uh, okay, uh, this is Tom, KE5ICX. We're going to take about a five-minute break, and then we're going to come back and be discussing the movie Inner Space from 1987. So uh, go get your favorite refreshment, powder your nose, and return in five minutes. KE5ICX. I was far too busy yesterday and today to to watch the movie, so I'm going to be leaving now, Tom. Uh, 73, and maybe, uh, since I'm just nearly finished moving in my house, I'm now sleeping here, new house, um, after another couple of weeks, maybe my activity level will go down from frantic to something lower, and I'll actually have time to start listening to the Afterglow movies again. In 5B, be clear. Goodbye. Bye, Bill. Alpha Fox 5 Delta. Good night. Bye, you. It's I, BB. Turning off the radio.
All right, it's time to come back, and we will be discussing tonight's movie called Interstate. This is KE5 ICX. I'll be your next control tonight. So here's what we got. This is actually a comedy from 1987. Science fiction comedy, an American film, directed by Joe Dante and produced by Michael Pennell. Steven Spielberg served as an executive producer. And it was inspired by, in case you wondered if you'd seen this film before, the 1966 science fiction film Fantastic Voyage, which we also have discussed on this net. Starred Dennis Quaid, Martin Short, Meg Ryan with Robert Picardo, yeah, that guy, and Kevin McCarthy with music composed by my favorite composer, Jerry Goldsmith, earned $25.9 million worldwide in theatrical rentals, and won an Oscar for Best Visual Effects, the only film directed by Dante to do so. I'm going to read you the summary about what it was, in case you didn't see the film. Uh, it probably includes spoilers, but don't worry, it kind of runs the way you would expect such a movie to do. And if you've seen fantastic voyage you already know the plot it's just funnier in san francisco down in his bluff u.s navy aviation state tour lieutenant tuck pendleton uh, resigns his commission and volunteers for a secret mineralization min miniaturization experiment he's placed in a submersible pod both are shrunk shrunk to microscopic size they are transferred into a syringe to be injected into a wabbit but the lab is attacked by a rival organization led by scientist Dr. Dr. Margaret Kanker that plans to seize the experiment and steal the miniaturization technology, which is nothing more than a heat sink for a transistor, in case you were wondering. Experiment supervisor Ozzy Osborne Wexler, knowing, knowing their intentions, escapes from the syringe. The chase ensues with one of Kanker's henchmen, Mr. Igo, which ends at a nearby shopping mall. After being shot, Ozzy injects Tuck and the pod into an unsuspecting Jack Cutter, a hypochondriac Safeway grocery clerk, the first person he comes in contact with. On regaining consciousness, Tuck is unaware of what has happened and believes he's been injected into the wabbit. After attempts to radio the lab are unsuccessful, he navigates the pod to an optic nerve and implants a camera so he's able to see what the host sees. Realizing he's inside a human, he makes contact by attaching another device to Jack's inner ear, enabling him to talk to Jack. He explains that the pod has only a few supply of oxygen and needs his help in order to extract him by going back to the lab. At the lab, the scientist explains to Tuck and Jack that the other group stole one of the two computer chips that are vital to the process. Their mastermind is Victor Scrimshaw. His henchmen include Tanker, Ico, and the Cowboy. Jack conducts contacts uh, Tuck to his strange girlfriend, Lydia Maxwell, a reporter who has had dealings with the Cowboy. They learn that he plans to buy the computer chip from Scrimshaw after locating and knocking him unconscious. Tuck uses the pod's equipment to control Jack's face muscle, altering his features so he looks like the cowboy. Lydia and Jack, posing as the cowboy, meet with Scrimshaw to steal the chip from him. However, as they are about to take possession of it, Jim's nervousness overrides the transformation of his face, exposing the scam. I go, captures him, and Lydia and takes him to their laboratory. While in prison, Jack and Lydia share a kiss, which, unknown to them, transfers Tuck into Lydia's body through their saliva. Once taken to the laboratory, the criminals shake, shrink Iglo and inject him into Jack to locate Tuck, kill him, and obtain the other chip that was attached to the pod. Once Iglo has been injected, Jack and Lydia escape steal back the chip and order everyone, including Scrimshaw and Kanker, in the laboratory at gunpoint into the miniaturization device. However, not knowing how to operate it, they only manage to shrink everyone to one half their original size. Tuck now inside Lydia finds a growing baby and realizes she is pregnant with his child by going to her eardrum and playing their song, Sam Cookie's Cupid. He is able to alert him them 
what has happened. Jack and Lydia kiss again and transfer back. They frantically drive back to the lab in order to enlarge and not realizing the shrunken scrimshaw and canker are hiding in the back seat. While they attempt to subdue Jack and Lydia, I go locate Tuck and Jack's esophagus and attacks him. Tuck just Abel's, I goes craft, and the latter is killed after Tuck drops him into Jack's stomach. Back at the lab, with only minutes of supplemental oxygen left in the pod, Jack follows Tuck's instructions to eject it from his huge lungs, from his lungs by making himself sneeze due to his hairspray allergy. Tuck and the pod are successfully enlarged and he's reunited with Lydia and finally gets to meet Jack in person at Tuck and Lydia's wedding held at Wayfarer's Chapel. I guess that's a real place. Tuck is seen wearing the chips from the experiment as cufflinks. When they climb into the limousine, it is revealed that the cowboy is the driver in the trunk and scrimshaw and Kanker are hiding inside a suitcase in the trunk. Now confident and in control of his life, Jack recognizes the cowboy and jumps into Tuck's vintage 1957 Mustang, pursuing the limousine to rescue the newlywed. God and Orphine, as they say. Orphin, as they say. All right, everyone who usually checks in knows the rules. That's what we'll do. We'll take check-ins. I'll ask you for your call sign, your name, and did you see the movie? And even if you didn't see the movie, that's okay. You can check in. We'll be discussing something maybe like, I don't know, Fantastic Voyage. You never know. It's the same plot. You could say you saw the movie and not really have seen it and still be able to get major plot points if you did see Fantastic Voyage. The first round will be uh, what you thought about the plot will be uh, special effects, music, and anything else you didn't cover in the first two rounds. So let's go ahead and get started. I will take check-in. Tonight's movie is Inner Space from 1987. So please come with your call sign, your name, and did you see Inner Space? November Tango 5, Tango Mike. Tony and Dallas, I saw it when it first came out, and I've forgotten most of it. Kilo Bravo 9, Sierra Oscar Kilo, shot in Fort Worth. Yes, I did see this. India 5, Kilo Whiskey Golf Cruise at Arlington. I did not. I tried, but my link didn't work, and they wanted me to pay money for it, <laughs> and I chose not to. KI5, KWG. November Victor 5, Foxtrot, Virginia in Fort Worth. I have seen this movie many times, but I did watch it again. Folks checked in. I got NT5TM, Tony in Dallas. He did see it. KB5SOK, Sean in Fort Worth. Yeah, he saw it. KI5KWG, Cruise in Arlington. He did not because he said they it was behind a paywall. You should have watched the YouTube one. Maybe that was the one you couldn't get to work. I don't know. It had uh, a few ads at the beginning, but it was available for free. If you tried to do it today, I'll bet you, because it's April 1, they removed that movie as a freebie. Betcha, betcha, because that's what happens at the beginning of the month. You were warned last week. Bad cruise, bad cruise. I don't know for a fact that that's what happened, but I'll bet you it did. Next up, NV5F, Virginia. She's seen it many, many times. She's in Fort Worth and having seen it many, many times in Fort Worth and maybe outside of Fort Worth, so I put her down as a yes. Anyone else want to join us? Tonight's movie is Inner Space. Let me know if you want to join us.
All right, I suspect some of the other usual suspects will show up. We'll just start going down the list now, and then I'll uh, call for additional check-ins when I get to the bottom of the list. So let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with Tony, NT5TM. Tony, you saw Inner Space. I know it's been a while and you can't remember the plot, but maybe you can. Just think about Fantastic Voyage, only funnier. Although there's some pretty funny shots in, in Fantastic Voyage. I particularly like the white corpus so going after Donald Plaza. He deserved it, and his little kitty, too. Uh, Tony, what'd you think from KE5 ICX? Well, thank you, Tom. And in fact, Isaac Asimov was uh, signed by his agent to write the novelization of Fantastic Voyage. And he felt terrible about it, like it wasn't a very good book at all, because, he, of course, he had to follow the movie closely. And it's a movie, not a book. So he actually wrote a sequel many years later called Fantastic Voyage 2, Destination Brain, uh, which I do own a copy of, actually. And it's kind of strange and fascinating. So I remember thinking this movie was basically okay, and I remember Dennis Quaid, he's a very distinctive guy, and I'd, I'd seen him, I'd, uh, did he play Gordo Cooper? I can't remember. Uh, but anyway, I just remember thinking it was okay, but it's been so long, and unfortunately today was all just spent outdoors, uh, walking the dog, fox hunting, yard work. Uh, since I had to do everything, I would have done the whole weekend today, because it's going to have bad weather tomorrow. So. I remember having a vague positive opinion about it, but I'm hoping that people will say more that might convince me to re-watch the movie. I mean, it's going to be a rainy day tomorrow. NT5 TM. Ah, okay, Tony. Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you something, too. I, I read Isaac Asimov's book, The Fantastic Voyage, and I know, and I also read one of, well, I've read many Isaac Asimov's books that he did mention, and he had another book about having to write that book, and he did change it so that, uh, and, and, and that the uh, submarine, after it got eight, uh, that all of those components, of course, are going to get larger, but, of course, the people who wrote the telephone, uh, the, the screen, uh, had a, 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 what is it? The screenplay, that's it, the screenplay says that, that, well, it ate it out of what else is going to happen. And in this book, the same thing happened when the story is the same thing happened. The submarine, so that the, uh, I go, actually ends up, you know, being eaten or dissolved. It's, well, all those components should have gotten back to full size and built the, uh, what's his name, that it did. Oh, and by the way, for the fun of it, uh, yeah, I had a very good day, too. I, I did the uh, Irving 10K, well, not the marathon, but the 10K, which is six miles. I came in number five in my class. I didn't know about that. They got kept the secret for last year, for last year. Okay, next up is Sean, KB5SOK. Sean, you saw the movie. What did you think about the plot for Inner Space? Yeah, this is KB9 S OK. Um, and congratulations on your run, by the way. Um, yeah, th this was, you know, I would say 75% comedy, 25% uh, sci fi, uh, which is a little bit of a, co a weird combination, at least for me. Uh, this obviously wasn't in your face like space ball comedy, and it obviously wasn't just a, a serious sci fi with comic relief. Um, this is clearly, it was almost like it was written for Martin Short, his kind of physical comedy, um, which is kind of really what the focus was here. Um, the, as far as the actual plot goes, it, it did obviously, as it's already been mentioned, followed the other movie uh, pretty closely, uh, other than the comic bits. Uh, you know, we start out the movie with your, your classic reluctant or, or problematic hero that has either done something bad or, or doesn't want to do something good. And, and obviously, you know, we start out seeing him drunk and making a scene, and, and ultimately in the end, he ends up, you know, doing the right things. Um, so, yeah, we, we've seen that trope so many times in so many movies. Um, it, it almost, you know, it, it's, uh, in some respects, kind of getting old uh, <laughs> that we've seen so many times. And obviously, then the rest of the movie, you, you know, follows pretty closely to the other one. Um, the plot was just okay for me. Um, 
be that this has such a comedy twist to it. It really boiled down to whether or not you like that kind of comedy, whether or not you're going to like this film or not. Obviously, it had a lot of big names tied to this film. Um, I was kind of expecting better, to be quite honest. Um, I'm surprised I hadn't seen this. It, it didn't ring a bell when I watched it, but I'm really shocked that I hadn't seen this. If I did, I, I must have totally forgot about it. Um, but uh, it was just, it, it, unfortunately, it wasn't really my kind of comedy. Um, I, I know Martin Short's very popular, but his kind of comedy just doesn't really make me laugh all that much. So it, uh, so it was just, eh, it was just okay. I mean, obviously, we've watched way worse films. You know, at least it was ever put into this. Had a decent sci-fi look to it, and uh, they obviously stressed about the Martin Short character being, you know, obviously, you know, nervous about everything. You know, didn't want to take any kind of risk of any kind in life. Um, and that was just so overdone and drove in that it was, I think they spent too much time, in my opinion, on focusing on that at the beginning and just kind of drug out that part. Um, I, I know what they were trying to drive home, but, uh, you know, it was just, but, you know, but this film is also extremely predictable and partly maybe because we've seen other films like it and obviously the movie that was copied off of. Um, but you, you knew at the end that the hero would come forward and you knew the Martin Short character would eventually find his bravery. And you knew at some point, you know, the, the hero was going to get back with the girl, uh, which, which obviously is not a bad thing, but it's just, you know, this was just very, very predictable. Um, and, you know, there's definitely little plot holes, I would say. You know, for instance, like when they, they got transferred from the kiss, I, in the previous scene, they showed him much deeper into the body, so that didn't make a lot of sense, how he got there so quickly. Um, so that was a little strange. You know, there at the end, obviously, where he got sneezed out, you know, he, he, they showed him making his way that direction, so it kind of made sense. Um, I guess we should just be glad that it, he sneezed and not farted. <laughs> of course, that might have been funny. <laughs> but uh, anyway, this was just okay for me. Um, but uh, yeah, that's better I got on the plot. Back to net, KB9, that's okay. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, well, I, I understand. I, I kind of had the same feelings, and maybe that's part of the reason why I have never seen this movie until uh, last night. So, um, not because I was never really a huge uh, Mark Short fan. I like Dennis Quaid and everything he's done, but Mark Short, not so much. But uh, I'll wait until my turn. Now, Cruz sent me a note that says that he may be stepping away from the radio, but uh, he may have lied to me, so let me see if he's there. KI5KWG, Cruz, are you there? And do you have any comments? Maybe you saw Fantastic Voyage. That's pretty close to the same story. Just to uh, change out the regular characters for some, you know, plays in more Mark Short or something. He's on. He's, he's going to get gruff, so I'm sure he'll be back later. We'll we'll check on him a little later. Uh, next up is Virginia NB5F. Virginia, you've seen the movie many times, so you must have liked it. Like the plot. What'd you think about the plot? What, what were the good aspects, and uh, what would you think would might might have been better? I don't know. Uh, from KE5 ITF. KE5 ICX and the net is Virginia. Well, um, I think I was kind of the person who sort of suggested this movie. Um, I think you had brought it up on Facebook and I said, I said, yeah, we need to see this while it's still free. I saw it a few weeks ago or earlier this month and I remember thinking, we should watch this. I'll have to say I'm a little disappointed in our group. Um, for not watching it or, um, you know, I, I really think that it's a pretty good movie. Um, it's supposed to be over the top. I mean, it's a pretty over the top idea to begin with. Um, I, it's kind of a good memory from, from, you know, when I was young and, uh, I, do like Dennis Quaid, and yes, he did play Gordo Cooper, and he basically plays kind of that same character, you know, very brash, very sure of himself, um, and very
very funny. I, I thought Gordo Cooper was, you know, he totally made the right stuff. Um, and, I mean, the plot's complicated. It's definitely around the whole anti-hero thing where Martin Short is is called into the reluctant hero, you know, called into service of his almost polar opposite um, and uh, kind of getting bolstered by that by that uh, personality that's circulating around in his bloodstream and I think the, you know, and this may be getting more into characterization and stuff, but um, I thought the plot moved well. I thought it was fun. It was just convoluted enough. It was not to be taken terribly seriously. Um, I do like you, I do like that you notice that the uh, that the uh, minor, miniaturization ship is is a heat sink from one of those old uh, big old components. Um, and uh, I think I'm I'm with uh, I'm with um, with Sean that that the uh, the silliest I think the facial change program was probably the the silliest thing in the movie and you had all the silly you know the silly cartoony aspects of that and um, and the you know the silly character of of the cowboy. And Robert Picardo is a great character actor, and he does a really, you know, that's a that's a, you know, kind of just a funny, goofy character. Um, and uh, but I do think the probably the most implausible thing is that all these crazy, convoluted things they're going through to get the bad guy injected into the good guy, and you know, the big and and all the all the struggles he has, you know, trying to make sure he doesn't you know, go into Martin Short's heart to, like, accidentally cause him to have a, a heart attack or, you know, and, and having him sneeze to to get Dennis Quaid out of him at the end and just in time before he runs out of oxygen and all that. But the, the craziest thing in the whole thing is that they can go, you know, they can just kiss and, and the, you know, the pod changes people, you know, from just, and then they decide they want to, you know, they figure out that he's in, he's in uh, Lydia and Meg Ryan's character, and you know, they just go, oh well, let's kiss again, so he'll get back into, you know, he'll get back into uh, Martin Short's character. You know, it's just that's the dumbest thing in the whole movie, and um, I have to just kind of accept that as like the height of the silliness of the whole thing. Um, but I, you know. I just, I think the ending is good because, cause, uh, you know, um, Martin Short has found his own confidence from his adventure and he goes out and, you know, there is kind of, they're kind of set up for a sequel, but they never did have one. I guess they kind of thought, well, if this movie makes more than, you know, $32 million, maybe we'll make a sequel. But, um, you know, it, it, I think it stands okay on its own and, the music's great, and, you know, I'm getting into the part three of this anyway, but the plot, I just think it's silly, It's, but it's, you know, it's paced well, the writing is good, it's, it's a, you know, it's a high, high budget, you know, high production values movie with a pretty, pretty good script and, and uh, pretty good, pretty good action, and it never gets boring or anything, and um, I like it, I think it's a good plot, I, I kind of wish more people had seen it and could talk about it because I, I think it's, it's one of my, kind of one of my, you know, just favorites from back in the day. So, KE5ICX, this is NV5F. Okay, thank you, Virginia, and I, I think you, I kind of agree with you too, but I, I will hold my comment until we some more check-ins. So, are there additional folks that would like to check in this evening? We're talking about tonight's movie. Call your name and did you see the film? This is WB5OZL, Brenda, and I did see the film. One of the usual suspects, WB50ZL. Brenda, you 
saw the film. Uh, what did you think about the plot? Oh, I thought it was fine. Uh, obviously, it's silly, but it's meant to be light-hearted, uh, a light-hearted comedy. And, um, you know, it was, you know, kind of ridiculous in places, but it was entertaining. It was well-paced. Uh, oh, my gosh, the actors in this uh, unbelievable roster of talent in this thing. Music was good, of course. And uh, I didn't really have a problem. I mean, it, you have to, yeah, it was kind of a stupid premise. But, um, you know, it, the plot was okay in terms of uh, you could understand it. It wasn't overly stupid. It moved along. And, uh, of course, the actors carried it along. Too, so I think that helped. Uh, very, I just thought it was highly entertaining, and I have no quarrel with it. Uh, I might watch it again. Back to net, WB five zero zero. All right, thank you, Brenda. And you know, I've, I'm going to go ahead and make my comments now. Um, I, I I agree with you. I thought it was very entertaining. Uh, we'll get to some of the characterization in, in, in there because there's a right for that, I think. But as far as the plot was concerned, yes, it was fantastic voyage. Uh, it was pretty much a rip-off, as they suggested. And one of the things that I thought was interesting was reading some of the production stuff under Ricky, and I thought it was interesting because we had this discussion, or I'm going to bring up the discussion that we had a few weeks ago when we were talking about science fiction comedy and what works and what does not. And one of the things that's a problem with science fiction comedy is, is that you've got to be in on the jokes. You've got to understand why the joke is funny, uh, sometimes with a background, which is the one film we watched whose name I've forgotten already, Galaxina, I guess, uh, where you had to know all of the, you know, the insider jokes that went with um, uh, other films, although they were pretty famous films that people had seen, like Star Wars and that. Uh, this one kind of plays into that a little bit, but it actually better mirrors films that were uh, popular at the time, which is the, the juxtaposition thing, where people switch bodies and they get to be, or they are young, was it big, I think was one of the films, and I can't remember what one of the other ones was with the, uh, the switching the characters, the man with the faces, the man, uh, what was the... There, you can probably think of them from the 80s, any of these films where the character is acting, the actor is playing a different character than what he starts with in the movie, or she for that matter. So there's plenty of, this one kind of falls neatly into that, that uh, genre, so uh, you don't have to have any of the backgrounds with Fantastic Voyage. All you know is they just injected this guy in, and he's able to, to talk to him, and, uh, and, and, and kind of... Uh, semi-control, but also at the same time as life. So in this case, there's no special handling. You don't have to worry about all the science fiction stuff that the, uh, the Geek Squad having to come in and explain the film to you. It's pretty much straightforward. And that helps it. Another thing that it does, which is really kind of interesting, this is also sort of in the production information here, it's suggested, and that is, is that as a serious script, which was originally... Uh, presented as it, 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 there's straight jackets they put on and in some cases there may be even copyright infringement because Fantastic Voyage is a story and this is pretty much if you watch it you know it's familiar with Fantastic Voyage it's very similar as far as all the plot uh, pieces that went into it including the voyage itself so um, but it kept getting rejected well, as, as time went on, so they decided to just take the idea of the Fantastic Voyage and say, all right, how about we make it a comedy and then just go cold, totally wacky with it? Well, once you do it as a comedy like that, you throw away all the conventions. You don't have to worry about the science working or not. You're just making a comedy. And suddenly now you can have a completely different film that's not constrained. And I think that's what happened here. Now, 
you've got to be careful with that. It, it, and in this case, the, for some people who watched it, they felt that it crossed the line. It was too ridiculous, and it didn't work. Um, and and that can be the case. There were points in there which I thought were non not very convincing, such as the facial thing and turning into the cowboy. Highly unlikely, and that takes you out of the moment, I think, a little bit. But it's kind of fun how they just dealt with it. So I had no no issues uh, except with that, I think. And then, of course, the same story, like I was mentioning about the uh, um, Isaac Asimov's uh, problem, is, is that they left stuff inside the body, Martin Short's, or I, I, in uh, Martin Short's body that would have killed him. They even bring that up in the in the, uh, in the discussion. Just leave him in there. I'm curious to see what would happen when everybody could return to the full side while from inside of his body. Sort of a morose type of thing. I thought it was still interesting. Um, there's some technical aspects that we'll talk about later, but of course you just throw those away because it's a comedy. All right, we'll go back up to the top of the list. Um, I'll go ahead and ask if anybody else would like to check in at this point. Uh, if you would like to join us this evening, please come now with your call sign, your name, and get your seat. Thanks for the interspace. Okay, I suspected not. So we're going to move on to characterization. This might be a short net tonight, but every time I say that, it ends up going the full time. But we'll find out. Uh, next up is Tony in T5TM. Tony, what what did you think of the characterization and the acting in tonight's movie? Well, you know, now that you said that, I do remember a sort of a strange face transformation sequence. So yeah, I'm jumping ahead to the third round, but I definitely remember liking the effects in this all those years ago. Uh, I'm really sorry I didn't see this on time in, in Virginia. I, I promise I will do penance. I will watch this movie and appreciate it properly, even if I can't discuss it here. Uh, I don't remember the characters well enough to say anything. Uh, although I did notice that not only was uh, Dennis Quaid, Gordo Cooper in The Right Stuff, uh, uh, thank you, Ginger, for filling that in, uh, but Lance Henriksen and Veronica Cartwright, who was an alien, and he was an aliens, were also in The Right Stuff. So, ah, it's, it's fun to play Six Degrees with Kevin Bacon. But I have nothing else positive to contribute in <laughs> D5TM. Oh, man. Well, we're really going to go ripping through this movie really quick. So next up is Sean, KB5SO. Yeah, this is KB9S, okay. Uh, this is one place that it, it was pretty strong. It definitely had a, a really good cast, uh, a lot of strong actors in this thing, and, and, and there was a lot of characters. You know, a lot of times we watch, there's only really one or two. Um, but once again, it, 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 it's a comedy, so it, it's, you know, there's a lot of comedies that I've said that don't get a lot of credit, but uh, once again, it's just, you know, it's the kind of comedy you're saying. Um, for me, it wasn't, a, you know, and, and I know I kind of beat the film up a little bit last round. Um, it, it wasn't that I did it, you know, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it, uh, I disliked it, but it just also, too, I, did, I didn't really care for it. So it's just kind of, eh, you know. <laughs> um, but the characters, yeah, they're great actors. Um, like I said, I felt that this was very typical of films made this time, uh, you know, you know, the... Once again, uh, you know, the, the person starts out that's a reluctant hero and then moves on to be, you know, the hero. But uh, I guess, like I already said, you kind of throw all the rules out the window when it comes to comedies. Um, so maybe it's kind of hard to really judge because obviously we never get really super deep into each one of the characters. Um, you know, so it, it's kind of hard to say. Um, so yeah, I may leave this up to the rest of the group that kind of enjoyed it more to really dive into these characters. Because uh, they were all just, uh, to me personally, just not that particularly interesting. And being that I'm not a Martin Short fan, it was kind of those parts like I almost wanted to fast forward through. Because <laughs> it's just not my kind of thing, my kind of comedy. So, uh, Joy Disquade in it, 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 it and a lot of the other 
actors that were in it because that was the one thing that kind of kept my interest. Uh, and then obviously, third round, we'll talk about the special effects. So yeah, back to that, KB9, that's okay. Hey, Sean, thank you. Next up, let's see if Cruz is back from his uh, walkabout. KI5KWG, Cruz, are you back? Ah, uh, well, oh, he does remind me of something that I wanted to mention, and uh, Virginia did mention it earlier. And yet, thank you for uh, expediting this film because you're right. When, when when a movie like that comes out and it's available online, even if it's an older film like this one from 1987, it's still a popular film and it's done by a major studio. So its shelf life on free streaming is very, very short if they want to go ahead and, and do a pay-per-view type of thing. And they occasionally take a film and liberate it from pay-per-view to get you to consider other films on the streaming platform. In this case, YouTube, which does have a pay-per-view feature. Um, and they will take from their collection of movies and make it uh, freebie with ads uh, for usually a month, three to four weeks. And we were coming up on April 1, and sure enough, I just checked it uh, while one of the other folks was speaking, and it's gone. As predicted, January, I'm sorry, April 1, it disappeared. We watched it last night, it was on, and today, not so much. Okay, uh, and speaking of Virginia and B5F, you are next. Uh, what do you have to say about our characterization and uh, actors that are in this film from KE5 ICF? KE5 ICX, you're next. Thank well, I'll probably be saying pretty much what everybody's saying. It's, you know, the all-star cast, good character actors for the minor characters, uh, generally good performances. Um, you know, Tuck Pendleton was a, a comedic version of Gordo Cooper. I, you know, one of my favorite moments is where he slaps himself in the face and you know, and says, how does it feel? It feels good. And then he says, the Tuck Pendleton machine, zero defects. Um, that's so, it's so Gordo Cooper. It just makes me smile every time. And I like that they did the, they did a very typical juxtaposition, you know, of him with, with the, you know, skinny, small, nerdy uh, Martin Short. You know, they were basically supposed to be opposites and, and, uh, you know, Tuck Pendleton is injected into this guy who's got the opposite personality and ends up, you know, helping him overcome some of his nervousness and, and uh, timidity and uh, basically, you know, teaches him, how to, teaches him how to realize he really is brave and, and can be a hero. And at the same time, Tuck Pendleton learns to be kind of, you know, more more thoughtful and tender, and, and uh, Meg Ryan is always, she kind of always plays herself, but she's so lovable and fun and, you know, um, smart and and feisty and, and kind of what we'd always expect, and uh, she's a good, she's a good opposite. She's, she's the kind of woman who can handle somebody like Tuck, and it's, it's uh, you know, just, you know, pretty stereotypical uh, characters, you know, bad guys, and Robert Picardo is the cowboy, and the, you know, the Russian, the Russian fence who, who has this obsession with the American West, and wears ridiculous clothes, and, and, uh, talks in a funny accent, and, um, you know, just, just good acting, and good timing, good comedic, I, I like Martin Short as, a comedian because he does do the physical comedy, but I don't think he's ridiculous. Um, and the <laughs> one of my favorite scenes is the one where he uh, he goes to they go to Tuck's apartment to to look for clues about what's going on, and and um, 
and uh, he and one of the sillier things in the movie was where Tuck wants a drink, and so Martin Short has to drink some whiskey so that Tuck can, you know, stick out his miniature flask and you know catch some non-miniaturized whiskey. And, you know, I don't know how that would really affect him. They act like, well, you can't put regular air in his pot; it would explode or whatever. But he can, you know, drink, you know unpressurized whiskey. I don't know how that works, but uh, anyway, that's just a funny scene, you know, the scene where Martin Short gets drunk and, you know, starts just saying nonsense words and, and you know, and inside Tuck is getting drunk and partying inside the pod. And, and if you really think about this, Dennis Quaid had to really do some good acting because most of his, most of his part in the movie was sitting in this tiny little enclosed space and interacting, you know, with the person whose bloodstream he's floating around in, and and uh, it's kind of a neat idea. I, I think it's kind of a, it's kind of like a, you know, uh, multiple personalities kind of thing almost, where he starts to, you know, Martin Short starts to kind of adopt his personality, and and uh, and. Um, you know, the bad guys were all bad guys, and some of the, you know, some of it was pretty, you know, ridiculous, you know, spoofing on on uh, bad guys from James Bond movies and stuff, just all these ridiculous gadgets and and other, you know, weirdness that I won't go into. Um, and the, the scene where everybody's shrunk to 50% is, you know, just silly and... Um, I, I, I like the acting, I like the timing, I like the comedy, um, and uh, just the earnestness of Martin Short and uh, the lovable, you know, audacity of, of uh, Dennis Quaid came through, and I think it was a good opposite, you know, kind of opposites crashing into each other uh, kind of character, character plot. Uh, it was interesting. You care about the characters. You want the good guys to win. You want the bad guys to fail. Um, and that's what matters. I think that's what makes, you know, I think that's when you know something's working is when you do really care. You, you know, even if you think it's silly, uh, it's hard to not at least care a little bit about these people. So, uh, and the fact that Martin Short triumphs in the end and and quits his crappy job at the supermarket and tells his you know, tells his domineering fake girl can kind of just imagine what kind of great adventure it turns into, and it doesn't even matter that there wasn't a sequel. So, KE5, ICX, NV5F. Okie doke. Thank you, Virginia. And let's see, let's, uh, I'm for some notes, but i got to talk to Brenda anyway. WB50ZL, Brenda! Your thoughts on characterization and the acting in our film tonight, Inner Space from 1987. This is Kate 5 ICF. Thank you. This is WB5OZL. Um, well, you know, these actors are so amazing. Um, I, I can't think of anybody who was badly cast, and on the whole, I thought they did extremely well. Uh, Dennis Quaid is so watchable. Well, Meg Ryan is, too. We've seen her in so many things, and she's just everybody's sweetheart, so uh, we love her. By the way, those two got married a couple of years after this show and were married for about 10 years. So, uh, you know, what what a beautiful couple that was. And unfortunately, it didn't last. <clears throat> but... Um, yeah, I mean, it was a pretty good vehicle for most of the characters. Of course, I adore Robert Picardo, and this was a, a different kind of char uh, character for him, I thought. Uh, he's done a lot of character acting, but this was a little unusual. I was trying to figure out if that was a wig or his hair before he lost his hair, uh, but uh, maybe we'll never know. So, anyway, um, you know, if you look carefully, you can just spot all kinds of walk-on uh, cameos with stars and uh, uh, lots of little little bit, bit parts for them. That was kind of fun to watch for that. All 
Well, I think this may be a short one this evening. We'll, we'll see what we can do. I'm going to go ahead and make this a separate round since we're at 1128. We've still got a half hour to go if we feel so inclined. We'll go to the top. We will talk about the special effects of this hill. So, Tony, NT5TM, Tony, you got anything you want to say about special effects for interstate from KE5ICF? I feel so guilty. Uh, well, but in a smiling way. I mean, I don't really feel that. Uh, I remember liking them, but I don't remember why. So I have no details to offer. So sorry. I wish I could give you a longer break. I could read some pages from my book, NT5TM. Hey, Tony. This is Jim okay well that's fine you, you at least came to the came to the to, to the park cocktail party so that's okay uh we'll give you that uh, attendance on your thoughts on special effects on the film yeah this is kb9 that's okay uh well the the uh there was some very nice visuals in this film i'd say for the time uh they obviously did put some money into this uh, so that, that that was a definite positive for this film. Uh, the music was decent. Uh, you know, that was good there. It had good audio. Um, you know, and as it's already been joked about, you know, there's a few things, and I think it's part of the joke, or at least I think it is, you know, using the heat sink as the chip, which was just kind of ridiculous. And uh, and then they always had to use the arm to plug it in. You know, of course, they're there, and they just plugged it in by hand because it was just, there was no reason to do that. Um, so, yeah, that, you know, so that was kind of silly, but I think that was part of the joke. Uh, you know, their lab there wasn't particularly, you'd be say, well, is this a, a lab that could have designed something that's sophisticated? You would have said no. Uh, but they did make a big point in the film saying that this was, you know, an extreme, extreme, extreme low budget. And they were pretty much just using whatever they could find to, to put this lab together just to get the funding uh, to do it in a much larger scale. And then, of course, there at the end, that the bad guy's lab is very clean, very slick, you know, more what you'd expect from a high-tech lab, um, sort of. <laughs> so it, I think that, once again, was kind of part of the joke as well. Um, but, yeah, once you got into the to the body, I, I do see why it won a visual uh, award, because, uh, you know, they, they did put some effort in there. Um, so that, that was good. The only other inconsistency that I see, it seems like they kept changing the size of the as a little mini ship. It seems like in one place it was kind of large, the next place it was, you know, even micro size. And, and even once he got sneezed out, you know, when, when they picked it up with the, with the little uh, uh, needle nose or, or the tweezers, it seemed like the ship was quite a bit larger than what they showed in the body. So there's a little inconsistency there. Uh, but once again, it, it, it's a comedy. But, you know, I thought the visuals were decent in this. This, this was what, uh, one of the places that did kind of shine uh, other than, you know, that silly yet, but <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, decent music, uh, pretty good visuals, so not a lot there to uh, to knock on in that case, so yeah, back to that, KB9, that's okay. Right, thank you, Sean, and let's see, I'll, I'll try one more time on Cruz, he, he may be eating his food and doesn't want to get near the road of radio, KI5KWG, Cruz, you got anything you want to say? Are you back? I'm looking up here to see if he's been message. No. Well, I don't see anything, but Cruz, are you out there? Eh, I guess it's going to be antisocial tonight. Okay, well, I'm going to scratch him off the list. I'm not going to beg anymore. I tried. I did the best I could. Next up, Virginia, NV5F, Virginia. Your thoughts on special effects? KE5ICX, NV5F. Um, well, this was obviously a big budget film funded by a them, you know, the, probably the most famous American director at the time and and uh, one of the next most famous American directors directing it and um, it had a, it had a broad a broad spectrum of special effects it had everything from 
you know, high-tech action props to, um, to you know, crazy visual effects of the inside of the body, which I thought they did really well with. I mean, I think that was kind of the whole point of this and the Fantastic Voyage was to, you know, show these, that, the, you know, the body was the, the inside of the human body was as exotic as going into outer space, but this was inner space. So, um, you know, and I think with all the comedy and the good actors and the crazy plot, you know, that can kind of even take a back seat. Um, but yeah, I think that part was really well done. Um, just the kind of visuals of what the inside of the lungs look like or what, what it looks like, you know, being in a, you know, inside, inside of an artery or, or seeing fat cells or the back of the eye or, um, you know, and yeah, I, I agree with Sean, the scale of the little craft sometimes seemed to change based, you know, conveniently based on what they needed it to be doing. Um, and, uh, you know, and then there was the, there were also just the crazy, um, you know, effects of the facial change program that, that were sort of a, you know, they were more like the, the special effects of, of, uh, and there was some, probably a little animation in there and, um, pretty neat overall for the time. I mean, if you think about 1987 and, I don't think any of this was done with computers. They were starting to do a few things with computers back then, but I really don't know that in, I don't know that any of this was done with computers. It was before before that was very widely done, um, and uh, I, I you know I think it was pretty pretty cool. I I actually liked the whole idea of the the vector scope labs being kind of the underdogs, you know, in Silicon Valley because I mean that was really how it was you know startup companies were all over the place out there trying to come up with some crazy new thing that would catch on and uh, i think they did a good job of that with just the the you know the set dressing of the labs and the the juxtaposing of the high funded bad guys lab that's all run by you know some elite big big money somewhere versus the the scrappy little lab that actually invented the technology and the other, the bad guys are trying to steal it and and uh, that's kind of getting more into the plot, I guess. But, um, but yeah, I think it was very well done and I think it was pretty convincing and it, the visuals and the special effects definitely didn't distract from the plot. That, you know, that it wasn't like, oh, this is so bad. You know, it actually was very seamless and seemed realistic and you kind of, you buy it, you know, you... There are moments when you're like, yeah, that, that, you know, you really do believe there's a little guy in a, you know, microscopic little pod that's, you know, floating around inside of somebody's body. It, I think it was really cool. And uh, at the time, and it still, it still holds up. It's, I think it still is really cool. So, uh, yeah, music was good. Um, you know, you can't beat, you can't beat that music and, uh, you know, some great, some of the great film music um, written by Goldsmith um, and uh, big budget movie, great composer. Um, so overall, yeah, I thought all the visuals and music, audio, all that, just generally good production values overall across the board. KE5, ICX, NV5F. Thank you, Virginia. Next up is Brenda, WB5OZL. She said she kind of faded out for a minute or two. Uh, I had two naps today, so I'm, I'm pretty much awake, and she didn't get any, so she's taking, well, she kind of drifted away. I've done that as net control, so that does happen. So, uh, Brenda, you out there? Tell us about what you thought of special effects. Okay, bye bye, kid. Yes, I am here, and we have seen you fade out as net control. At least when I fade out, it's not on camera. This is wb 5 ozl Special effects. Well, okay, um, you know, when you compare it to this, uh, a, an unusual premise, uh, we don't know what miniaturization is supposed to look like. So, you know, that was all good. 
um, group of people got miniaturized, but they were, you know, the size of dogs or cats. They weren't really miniature. I, I didn't understand that part. I think why you could even still see them. They should be like microscopic. Uh, maybe I missed something. Uh, lots of car chases, lots of other kinds of chases and fights. Uh, plenty of action going on, just like we like it. Um, so, yeah, technically you say this is a science fiction movie, but, um, you know, it didn't have much in the way of special effects like you would expect with most sci-fi movies. That's okay. That's about all I got to say for now. WB five O said L back to net. Wow, that it? And the special effects were mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, let me say my thing uh, here. Well, it did win uh, for best special effects, I think, uh, for uh, a win for Joe Dante. So. Yeah, here it is, 1988 Academy Award for Best Visual Effects, won by their team. And, uh, yeah, for that, so it, 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 it did okay. Uh, I think, that personally, the special effects were pretty good, considering I agree with everyone that, indeed, the uh, ship kept changing size, but when you think about it, you kind of got to do that to show relative, you know, it, it gets too small on on frame, so they could change the size. Or maybe it was bad editing, I don't know. Um, hard to say. But that, that's basically how it works. I thought overall it was pretty entertaining. I enjoyed the fact that, that they have the homemade special effects in that. I think there was a mention in there to um, or the homemade equipment uh, that was uh, pawned off that special effects. So like the, the clunky CRTs and some of the hand, you know, made stuff. Most of that, I think, came from Woody Prop, which we talked about in the past. If you're looking for 60s and 70s technology, which they had some of that there, plus a few computers thrown in there for good measure, uh, you went to Woody's Prop to get that stuff. So that's what they did. Um, Say, oh yes, uh, the office. I, I don't remember if there was a comment here, but it triggered a memory. So I think there was a comment having to do with where it was located, you know, sort of in an industrial, light industrial park, like you would have business parks, uh, where you know lightweight stuff going on, literally. And in this case, uh, they walk in and it looks like unopposed, unopposing and simple, and yet it turns out to be just high tech business running in the background. I had that experience, actually, uh, when I worked with Xerox, I was a technician, I was called out to a location over in Detroit called the New Center area, which is where the GM World Headquarters was at the time, it was downtown, at, uh, downtown Detroit at the rent center. But, uh, it used to be uh, out in uh, an area of Detroit that was actually a community it was built up by GM and, and um, populated by executives with really nice homes that were out there for many years. It's also where Hits USA is located, which is the, uh, uh, the origins of, of Motown. But uh, there was also an area a few blocks actually south of that whole area that was sort of like a shopping area, but it had gone on hard times. Uh, the area was not exactly the nicest of the universe. And I had an address I had to go to to service Equipment. And I I pull up and I look and the building looks like it's bombed out. I, this is, can't be right. And I didn't have a, there was no cell phone then and there was really no way to call because there was no phone anywhere to call because the whole area looked like a, you know, it's been bombed out. And I looked and on the, on the door there was a doorbell and it was illuminated. So I knew this place had electricity and the doorbell was new. So I got out, pulled my bag, and uh, parked the car out front, hoping that it would be up on blocks when I came back out. I rang the doorbell. There was a slide 
anything that to the peephole type of thing and the person spoke to me, yes, I'm here from Xerox, I work for Xerox, and uh, so I was there to service the city. Oh, fine, uh, please come in. And I walk in, and there's an area, and there's people in funny suits, you know, the white, uh, white room type funny suits that you would expect. And uh, there's all sorts of lab equipment. And this is in an old building, probably built around 1910. And they put all this, this equipment in there. I mean, it was expensive stuff. And they were working on something. I don't know what. I wasn't going to ask because I didn't know if it was legit or not. It just appeared. And it was there. And uh, I, I worked on the equipment and all this scientific equipment sitting around. And, I left, my car wasn't up on blocks, and I checked back, I think it was a couple of months later, to see if they were still there, and the doorbell was there, but the light on the doorbell was not, so they left the building or abandoned it. I wonder to this day what that was all about, but there are places like that. Uh, that was not the only one that I visited, there was actually a, a place I visited for an F-16 project, which I'll tell you about some other time, which ran like something out of the, uh, out of the, what was the movie, um, the Andromeda strain, uh, with the, the agricultural thing on, on top of the, the big complex thing. But that's a funny story. I may have told it here, but I won't do it tonight. I'll leave you alone. Yes. So back to the props and all of that. It, I thought that they had done a nice job with the homemade stuff and CRTs. They, put all the things on there with the, uh, you know, with the lettering like you would have on, on the uh, Back to the Future, which I think is part of, part of the inspiration here was from Back to the Future and the, the uh, hacked up uh, DeLorean. I think that's probably kind of the vibe that they were looking for. I thought the hardware itself actually was kind of convincing. It really did. I didn't think that that whole spin thing, I don't understand, that was still a uh, that wasn't necessary. I think that they had kept it to more of like what they did with the business for uh, Fantastic Voyage. It would have been a, a, a much better story. Um, that kind of took me out of it because it made no actual sense that they would go and shrink you with some sort of spin technology. And if it was, the centrifugal force should have forced them against the window instead of the other way. So that confused me quite a bit. Uh, Music-wise, it was very good. There was a lot of electronic stuff. Uh, Goldsmith does not use electronic stuff to as, as, as they did in the beginning. He was never really a composer that liked the electronic. He would use it as, a, as, as an access, uh, such as in uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture, there was that, that whole major sound they made was, was done by a special instruments that have been created and, and then were used for the film. Um, very unique and it sounded like it was supposed to be a special effect but it was actually a musical instrument. He also did the same thing in Explorers where there's a squeak toy in it and it helps keep the beat throughout the film. It's just this little rubber squeak toy that he used to, to uh, give this kind of a whimsical score. So he wasn't, he wasn't above doing things like that but I thought it was kind of kind of interesting. So that in this film, he did actually go to a regular score more through the middle of it. But generally, it's the director that decides in that case whether they're going to do an electronic score or not. Goldsmith refers to full orchestra. Well, he did. He's no longer with us. But that's what he would usually do. That was his preferred mode. But not always. presentation of the film I thought was good. It was nicely uh, produced. Uh, sound video, uh, sound uh, picture and all that was clean and clear, which is great. And uh, it was a copy that we watched last night before it disappeared. It looked pretty darn good. It's nice watching something that's got a nice crisp picture when most of the time you have to watch the old blurry stuff that they had to pull from a land dump, landfill somewhere and restore it to the best of their ability. So uh, it's kind of nice having that, even though it was short-lived. 
All right, uh, I'm going to go ahead and open it up. Does anybody have any additional comments they want to make or any late check-ins? Please come with your call now. Hey, Virginia, go ahead. MV5S from KE5 IC. Yeah, um, I, there was one thing Brenda had mentioned, and I, I don't know if she's even, you know, she might have just crashed after her, her last over, but um, uh, she said she was didn't understand the the scene where the characters were, you know, not all the way miniature. The kind of the funny the, the scene they played for comedy with the bad guys. I guess they were only half size, which is another aspect of the special effects they did. They did a whole, they did a lot of different special effects in this, and they did all that, you know, forced perspective, people being different sizes and all that. That's that's actually a pretty challenging, but. Uh, that was when uh, uh, Meg Ryan and Martin Short were trying to miniaturize the bad guys to, in order to, uh, you know, in order to pacify them, and they didn't know how to operate the machine. And instead of miniaturizing them to like 0.0005 percent, they miniaturized them to just 50 percent. They, you know, something with one of the controls. They messed it up, and and so that was kind of, you know played as a joke, you know, like, oh, they were supposed to be microscopic, but they came out half size, and so they were, you know, these weird little people, you know, so anyway, that's all I wanted to say. I just wanted to clarify that in case uh, she was still listening, and um, anyway, I, I enjoyed inner space very much when I was younger, and I still enjoy it now. It's just kind of a, it's kind of like comfort food now. I just play it, you know, I'll put it on sometimes when I just want to, want to just have something relaxing that I'm used to. So anyway, I hope the rest of you enjoyed it at least to some degree, and I hope everyone has a good night in the 5 f Very good. Thank you, Virginia. Thanks for the explanation, and uh, that is correct. So I see a note here from uh, Cruz. He says, ah, still listening, but radio is a block away. Jeez, the guilt. I will never not watch it. Never not watch again going to confession in the morning. So we shamed him because he wasn't avail available for us this evening to discuss small people in movies. But that's okay. There are only, what is it? There are there are no small roles, only small actors. Is that how that one goes? I don't know. One of my favorite movies. One of these days what I should do is just go completely rogue and do one of my favorite movies, Sunset Boulevard. I just love that film. Uh, maybe I'll sneak it in sometime. All right, here we go. Next week's movie will be, and it's called, from 2020, called Escape 2120. It says an orphan teen helps two scientists travel to the future but ends up centuries beyond them in a primitive new world that has been expecting him. Now, I'm going to double check this and make sure this isn't, this sounds like a similar plot. If it's what I think, I will swap it out with something else because there was a movie with a similar plot, but I don't think it's the same film. If it is, I will change it. So, uh, check it, uh, check your inboxes tomorrow morning sometime. I will uh, provide all of the details there for next week's movie. Say 7-3 to everybody, had a good time. Fun discussion, even though it was just a small group. Maybe we can collect others next week. So with that, I'm going to say good night, and I'm going to go watch uh, the last of um, what is this? Um, Kojak, The Night Stalker. This is one that I have not seen. And I think it's recording in the background. I have to go and watch it. It's Laura Parker in it, who I I love. She was in uh, Dark Shadows. So this, this actually came out shortly after Dark Shadows had been uh, canceled. And in the series, she played Angelique Love Interest, one of his colonists, his vampire from that soap opera series. So it's kind of fun seeing her in, in this, even though I can't really hear it. 
But um, anyway, it's always nice to see stuff like that. There's somebody else that's been all that. Oh, uh, Bernie Koppel, uh, who played Siegfried, and also uh, Captain Stubik on the Love Boat, also as Bernard Koppel. All right, see you all later. And don't forget, watch the face at, oh, at 12 o'clock. Tonight's episode is one of my favorite. Um, is it to a hostile planet when the Jupiter gang go back to Earth only in 1948? See ya. This is KE5 ICX. I'm now clear. KI5 KWG. Bless me, net controller, for I have sinned. <laughs> Okay, I'll watch this film as soon as I get a chance. Good night, y'all. Okay, I got KWG. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, I, I think you'll like it. It's, it's it's actually kind of a film that you would like, I think. It's, 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 it's really kind of humor that, that is acceptable to you. And it is to me, too. I'm not saying, uh, not playing elitist or anything. It's not for everybody, but I think you would like this film.